So then I think I shall introduce the next speaker, who, who is Frank Ignacek. He's a member of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, he's our contact man to the Maine Historical Commission, which is the government body that has to do with historical things in this town. He's also a longtime employee of DEC and of Compaq still. And uh, he has this extra sixth sense uh, to find things that Compaq is getting ready to throw away that has something to do with Maynard, uh, with our history, and he has a wonderful way of getting a hold of it and getting it down to us before it's gone. Uh, Frank. In 1957, Ken Olson, his brother Stan, and Harlan Anderson came to Maynard and leased 8,500 square feet of space in the mill, joining nearly two dozen other small companies in the 1.1 million square foot former home of the American Woolen Company. Digital Equipment Corporation was born. Through the years, a long and wonderful relationship developed between Ken, Digital, thousands of digital employees in the town of Maynard. My name is Frank Ignachuk. I'm a Maynard selectman. I'm a third generation Maynardian, a third generation mill rat, and digital badge 2169. In the last week, I have drafted over four pages of Ken Olson introduction notes for tonight. And I realized two things. Number one, I wasn't even making a dent in that project. And number two, you didn't come here tonight to hear me speak and neither did I. And so on behalf of the Maynard Historical Society, the people of the town of Maynard, and your employees and friends gathered here this evening, welcome back to Maynard, Ken Olson. Thank you. Maynard's been a great town, a fascinating town, and fascinating stories in history. I don't think you've come to hear my stories of history, but I'll tell you a few. You will know them better than I do. It's always surprising to find out that this was the communist city. <laughs> I'm married to a Finn, so I'm a little sensitive to Finns. And, uh, Finns have no love for Russians, Swedes either, but particularly Russians, they love no love. But in the, fin the Finns, there were a large number of communists. Now, they weren't communists of the kind we think of. They were more socialist, definitely not Bolshevik. The most socialistic thing they did was start the co-op. Now, a number of you are young enough to remember the co-op. Very successful grocery store, very successful gas station. The part I only know because I read the book was the right-wing Finns try to show that they could do it too, and they failed. <laughs> My brother and I bought Red Hall. That's about two doors up from Bughouse Corner. The book never told me what Bughouse Corner got its name from. <laughs> Somebody have to tell me that sometime. We paid eight thousand dollars to buy, give it to the boys' club. The stage were red flags, and it was where the red. Um, the, uh, on Parker Street, the little brown house that's still there among the industrial buildings, the original group company that bought the land bought it on the condition that the old widow could stay there as long as she lived. And then when she died, we took over and kept it as a remote meeting area. And in the attic was a box filled with communist magazines. <laughs> and it's fascinating that in our world, we forget that there were a lot of nicest people who had this socialist point of view because they were so nice, and Maynard had it. It was also fascinating early years to see old Finnish women on bicycles going down Main Street. You can always tell one if you've been in Finland. Um, it's also interesting to hear them counting in the store. Um, 
And then, of course, the other fascinating thing about Maynard is there are so many ethnic groups. Um, the Polish priest, I think, I met tonight. Um, we always got along well with the Irish priest in his church because we were neighbors. We exchanged services. We didn't get along with the Polish church. So I told our guys, hey, this is terrible. You Polish fellows, you make sure we get along with the church. So after I was fired, the Polish priest came and gave me a sweatshirt with Polska on it and made me an honorary Pole. So now I'm honorary Pole. <laughs> The, um, of course, the other fascinating story about Maynard is how it was formed. The Maynard was part of largely Sudbury, Stowe, and Macken, yes. And um, the mill developed here. Maynard was the relatively rich town. They wanted good schools and street lights and the farmers weren't interested, so they petitioned to make it a separate city, and it was formed of the three towns, very tiny, and developed the mill in the town. It was interesting, in times later, the rich suburbs were Sudbury, and some of the others, and this was the mill town. The um, mill was a great place for us to start digital. We. We're at MIT, and um, there's part of the story that a lot of people don't realize. We came here to Maynard, start a company to introduce the personal computer. The first personal computer was made at MIT, started in World War II. The Air Force had MIT build a, start a wind tunnel to test airplane models and they wanted it controlled by a computer. And they started off with a serial computer, and it was too slow, and then a serial computer was too slow, and a parallel computer. And this com computer had unusual characteristics for the day. There's only two or three or four computers being made in the world, and they were all there to grind away on long mathematical formulas, and they print these books of artillery tables and sometimes math tables with great precision, a lot of digits, and these machines are on 24 hours a day, usually mechanical. The one in Harvard had a shaft. It's been a long time since I saw it, but I think the shaft is about this big around, around 300 feet, I think. Now, these numbers aren't very precise. And this thing would run this mechanical computer, and it would print these numerical figures on page after page after page. The clever thing was that it numbered the page, too. Now, the problem that MIT had to solve was quite different. It had to be fast. And anything physical, you can't measure very precisely. So they picked 16 bits, which is a little better than you can measure things physically, a lot better than you can measure in a wind tunnel. And it had to be very fast. So they made it the fastest they could make it. And with the experience MIT had in vacuum tubes during the war, they made exceedingly thoroughly engineered circuits, very complex, and uh, put them in a room. The building uh, was two stories with a basement, and uh, half again as big as this building, oh, maybe, maybe two dimensions, at, at double the size. And the computer room itself was maybe as wide as this, and halfway back. And it was 16 digits. There were 16 racks, 22 inches wide. There was eight, and then a column, and then eight more. And one column was the arithmetic element, did the arithmetic. Another had 16 pairs of storage tubes. These were like television tubes. On the face, they would store the numbers. Those of you who use PCs will find it's a little hard to believe, but each tube stored 256 bits. If both tubes worked in all 16 racks, they had a total of 512 words of memory to do programming in. Now, that was a challenge. Um, the first serious problem they tried is, oh, the war was long over. I showed up in 1950. The machine was almost working. And about that time, they were allocating television stations across the country. You want as many stations as you can, and yet separate each channel by a certain distance so that they wouldn't interfere with each other. 
think that's a complex problem, and they couldn't do it at MIT. It didn't have enough memory. Oh, by the way, for those of you who never thought about it, you hear about the year 2000 problem? It comes about when people had so little memory that you wouldn't waste part of that on putting 19 in front of 1950. You just put 50. Now, this is off any issue, but just for your information, the stupid people who got into that trap, you have to be sympathetic with. Because common knowledge, everything you read in the globe is common knowledge, and usually wrong <laughs> on technical issues. I'm always a good friend of the management and the, and the editor there. But common knowledge says that technology changes every three years. So people who wrote software, it's all going to be over three years. What difference does it make? We'll never, it'll never last until year 2000. Well, oh, one of the reasons I was fired at digital is I said, <laughs> I said, the mainframe computer will never die. And the Boston Globe said, he's obviously too old. Everybody knows the PC is going to take over the mainframe, and the PC is more powerful than the mainframe. Well, if the mainframe is going to die, why is it still running the same software they did 30 years ago? <laughs> And you see, the rule, the thing to learn from that is, hey, common knowledge is usually wrong. And uh, so people who wrote software four years ago was thinking by now, 2000 be gone, now I've got to live with the terrible results. It's not too serious to worry about it for, for us as citizens. Now, that computer they built there was a personal computer because it, even though it's big, huge, 10,000 vacuum tubes. One person used it. He sat in front of it with a cathode ray tube. It was round then. It didn't look like they look today. And he had a keyboard. And it didn't look quite as graceful as they look today. And he had a printer. And he didn't have a mouse. He had a light pen, which they invented in England again, that he wrote on the tube with a light pen instead of using a mouse. But in every sense of the word, it was a personal computer. Huge, but one person used it, it was all his, and he could do real time interactive computing. We didn't know the word personal computer, so we call it interactive computing. Now, we started digital to introduce that interactive computing to the world. Um, we did one other thing. While we were at MIT, we made a transistor computer, and we gave one to the students at MIT. When we started at digital, our first computer, we, one of the first computers we gave also to MIT. And on the second floor of the building, above the IBM computer, the students could do anything they wanted with these machines. And um, the floor below, with the IBM machine, you brought your problem in, put it in a cubby hole, like post office cubby hole. And the next day you came back and got the answer, and the answer usually was, you made a mistake. Do it over again. A floor above with a digital computer, DEX computer, and the one we made at MIT, students would interact with it, make a mistake, correct it. And they, just like people use today, they sit and look at it, and it tell you you made a mistake, or tell you the next step, and people would interact. And out of that group came a number of interesting things, some useful. One was games. One of the best computer games came out of there called Space War. They also did what they called expensive typewriter, which is today word processing. And they noticed that when one person sat in front of it, he'd get an answer back to the computer, and then he had to think for a while to give the to decide what he was going to do next. You all, those of you who watch someone with a computer, see that happening. And they thought that time. Somebody else could use the computer. So they set up, with Digital's help, several people on the computer at the same time called time sharing. And that meant several people had terminals, and they would share their computer, and because none of them are using it all the time, each thought he owned the whole thing. And that was a key part of what we introduced and sold at digital. Now, another thing came out of that 
when you had terminals, several of the people using machines at the same time, the obvious thing was to put some of them remotely. And with that remote connection, developed what we call today networking. That digital, long before internet, we had the world tied together, all the military, all the, all the university laboratories were all tied together networking. And it all came from this time sharing system which had to tie all the terminals together to the computer. My wife doesn't use computers, but in those days she did play Scrabble with a terminal connected by telephone. My son, who I thought was never mischievous, I had a couple computers I'd had at home, and he had all at night he had all the computers at MIT and all the computers at Digital tied together <laughs> over networking. Now, when we started in 1997, we had finished the transistor computer at Digital, and we wanted to start a company to introduce those ideas and use those circuits to show the world commercially what could be done. Now. My wife says I have a reputation for always being contrary. Well, that's not true, of course. <laughs> but anything important we did, the world was against. Now, there's a very strong reaction against interactive, what we would call personal computers. People said almost as if it was a religious issue. It's wrong to have people have a computer to themselves. It's wrong and have somebody sit down and type a whole computer. It just doesn't make sense, you know. Well, we lived through that one. And um, the rest of it grew from there. Now, we picked Maynard for a very simple reason. There was nice space available for 25 cents a square foot. I was told by the new owners that it cost you $11, $11 a square foot now. When we took, that was the first, second floor building 12. I think we then took the third floor for 15 cents a square foot. Um, that's a big advantage. When we moved in there, well, we, we went to American Research and Development Corporation in Boston, told me we wanted to go into business, and uh, we made a proposal. And normally raising money, they were the original risk capital company, normally raising money took quite a bit of time. They were very doubtful. When we went to make our proposal to the board, someone said, remember, they gave it to us to do three things. So remember, no one's made money on computers, and, and Fortune magazine said nobody ever will. So be careful, don't propose computers. So we said we'll make modules. Um, I don't remember the second one right now without thinking hard, but the third one was they said, promise fast results because most of the board is over 80. <laughs> so we promised to make profit here. year. Um, they were fascinated and couldn't say no. The deal we made, we probably should have negotiated harder. We got $70,000 um, and we started the company on that. Now the nice thing about $70,000, you can watch every one of them. And, and we did. Um, we went in the second floor of building 12, and it was original mill space, and our office was there already. It was made of old doors, and there was a roll-top desk there, which we couldn't use because you couldn't put your knees into it. There was no place for your knees. When we finally took the desk out to get rid of it, we realized it was wrong. The top was put on wrong, and there was a knee hole on the other side. And all those times, we never knew. <laughs> we took my partner's lawn furniture, and that was our office furniture. Um, my wife cleaned the Johns, and uh, we did everything ourselves. When we got put partitions up, we um, came in on Saturday and put up the partitions. We did it quickly, and made a mistake. We had a long row of partition, they all fell over. We had to put them up again. The uh, one time, my brother Stan and Anderson were away, and then come a load of 22-foot aluminum extrusions and had to get up the second floor. There was an elevator shaft without an elevator in it, and I cut a little hole in the floor and run down and put one up through that hole, go up and pull it up, run down, put another one up and pull it up. <laughs> um, and we learned a lot. 
we, um, Anderson and I both, different schools, learned, studied economics with Samuelson's book. And the nice thing about Samuelson's book, in two pages he explained in simple terms, double entry bookkeeping. And with that, we were able to make a business plan. We were able to run business. The nice thing about starting this way, you could learn everything as you went. There was all sorts of practical things we learned. Pigeons have always been a problem there. I haven't seen them for a year, a long time. Uh, there was no air conditioning course, so a pigeon would come in. And we'd have to chase the pigeon until he collapsed, and we'd put him out the window and he'd fly away. And we discovered that a man could outlast one pigeon, Two pigeons could outlast any man. <laughs> Maynard Supply sold some material and huge toothpaste tubes. You put on the window sill, supposed to keep the pigeons away. The pigeons away. The um, pigeons we caught then had that goo all over the feet. <laughs> the history of pigeons continued, of course. One time we called the Audubon Society, and they told us, "You go to the farm store and get this poison." We thought, we thought, you love birds. Yeah, we don't love pigeons, though. So. <laughs> Second time I went to the farm store, farm store, and they said, we don't know what you're talking about. Because the rules had just changed, and they wouldn't want to admit what they'd done. Another time, we went to the government, and the government said, all right, we'll give you the material, but you've got to pick up the dead pigeons before anybody sees them, because we don't want anybody complaining. <laughs> the final solution to pigeons was to have a little tray with whiskey with corn in it and that would knock them out. <laughs> I had a better idea, which we never were able to try. When a hawk would circle up above, the pigeons would be in terrible turmoil. And I figured we had a kite overhead with a pigeon silhouette, with a, like a hawk silhouette, we'd take care of our pigeon problem. Now, for a long time, we did everything ourselves. We made it was a good town for this kind of an operation. Besides Maynard Supply, there were four hardware stores. Uh, Parker was one, Omicha was one. Um, later on, town, town hardware came. But before town paid, that was later on. Anyway, there was four of them, and with that we could get anything. Um, and the good five and 10. We uh, made silk screens by wooden frames we stapled the silk on and we made the screen for each circuit. We'd silk screen on the copper and we'd dip them in ferric chloride in an aquarium tank for the 5 and 10. And uh, then we'd wash off the screen and, and we, had a, we had a ceiling filled with screens. We would uh, solder them by hand in a solder pot. And uh, we learned all the problems of soldering. The floor we were in, I think, had a 60 amp fuse box. We asked the power company to give us more power, and enough people had entered the mill who wanted more power and then disappeared, they said no. So we had a fan blowing on the circuit breaker box so we could get a little more power out of it. <laughs> One day, somebody driving by called the power company and said, the transformer is smoking. <laughs> they got us power quickly then. <laughs> Once in a while, we'd spill the ferric chloride. There was this Arthur's furniture store on the floor below. And I think we bought the same set of living room furniture several times. But I think he put the same set back, and each time we spill on it, we'd buy it again. Uh, we uh, learned a lot and learned how to uh, uh, get things done. We had to wind little transformers. They're little cores of ceramic. And we discovered the edges were rough on them. Um, so we went to the 5 and 10 and got a kitchen canister set, took the flour container type, and bolted on the side of our bandsaw and put a couple of containers of aquarium sand from the 5 and 10 in with the cores and let it rotate in a tumbling barrel overnight. And in the morning, the cores were smooth as silk. Um, I was the closest thing we had with t to tool maker, and not very good. But I made the tools for repairing our sheet metal. It was a little discouraging because I had some tools in the furnace being hardened, get a call away from the telephone, to the telephone, come back, and they're all burned up. 
but um, little by little we grew. We had our lunch every day, the three of us, at the bowling alley. Um, and then we stopped and do our shopping as we came back. And so we got to know the town well. It was fascinating to see the town develop in time where got rid of the trolley car tracks and the overhead power. Uh, it, the town was a good place to be also because people were used to working. The towns a little closer to Boston too often were made up of people who were bankers or professors. And people who worked in the mill were used to working eight hours a day or more, even when they weren't feeling well. And that tradition was very important when you really had to produce things. We had a crew of girls. That may not be what you call them today, but that's what we called them then. I still think it's a thing to call them. I always call my wife and my mother girls. Uh, women sound so old. But um, uh, they were great. They were called the um, glorious girls. And they really did a great job. I designed the workbench for them. We made it up out of chipboard, and I thought it was nicely designed, efficient, simple, good looking. Years later, we took it down, and I, they never told me the mistake I made. The girls on one side couldn't talk to the girls on the other side. It was blocked off. <laughs> they should have told me that. Um, now, we, um, we grew quite consistently and, and did quite well. Um, in time, we made a large computer and shipped the first one to Perth, Australia. There's no place on dry land farther away from here than Perth, Australia. When I was a kid, they said, you drill down, you go to China. No, you come out to Perth, Australia, or the water a little bit from there. And uh, we sent it down there. The software wasn't ready, and it was the first one. And my, my partner said to me, Ken, uh, you're in trouble. I said, I thought you were taking responsibility for that. He said, oh, no, no, I've been just doing these things to be helpful. Now, that summer, at the suggestion of an MIT professor that used to run the laboratory I worked in at MIT, suggested that I read Al Sloan's book called My Years at General Motors. Al Sloan, Alfred, I know him so well after being involved with him, I call him Al. He was really a generation before me, so I didn't know him, of course. But he took over, no, General Motors was um, a motley collection of car parts makers and car builders, undisciplined, uncontrolled, getting nowhere. And General Mills was largely owned by DuPont. And DuPont drafted one of their bright young accountants named Alfred, Alfred Sloan and said, you run it. And what Sloan did was break the company up into business units. And he said, each one of you is an independent business unit. You each have a budget, each have a plan. You all do your accounting the same way. Today we say you use the same software. And you're all responsible for that PL statement. And with that, he made General Motors the greatest corporation in the world. Now, this sounds kind of obvious, but it is against all human nature to give someone responsibility when you're the boss and then leave them alone. And still, at the same time, give leadership and direction. Uh, Al Sloan said, when he first wrote about this, make him independent, leave him alone. And the senior management's job is to make sure they don't get into trouble. In a later edition of his book, he said, I didn't realize then the inconsistency of this. Well, it's these inconsistencies, paradoxes that make up business. 
the senior man, Al Sloan's job was to make sure people were going in the same direction and had a goal, had a strategy, and still felt responsible. So the next morning after I discovered that our biggest project was without a leader and no one was taking responsibility, I got people together and said, now we're a new company today. We have four or so business units. They're all the products of the company. We made modules, we made small computers, we made large computer, and we had a service department. Each one is a separate business unit run by one person and his team, and they're responsible for their business. Now, everybody else in the company works for them. Kind of obvious, isn't it? It went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> Everybody in the company was dead set against it. One of the people who did our advertising and literature, did a good job at it, quit. He literally said, I'm 33 years old. I am not going to take orders from somebody 30 years old. He changed that in years later to say I fired him. That wasn't true. A lot of people left mad and in time said, changes why I fired them. Um, but you see, these business units, to be business units, had to have common set of services, which were literature, advertising, manufacturing, sales, and finance. And all these people were in these business units. Even the people who got that job were dead set against it. Every one of the directors of the company were dead set again and said, Jay Forrester, who gave me the idea, threatened to sue me for pulling a fraud on the public. The board thought we were doing well. We were growing and we were profitable. I was walking across Public Garden with General Dorio, who was head of the company that financed us, and I said, we're in trouble. We're going to have to do something. And this is what we ended up doing. But the board was dead set against it. There was not one person in the whole world who supported me except my wife. As obvious as that idea is, interesting thing happened. We were growing well in profit and volume. That day on, we went off on a new slope grew much faster and much more profitably. Now the reason is obvious. If you have someone running a group, that group is responsible for their own success. The professional pride drove people to do a good job. Now, if he was running it and he did a stupid thing, he was going to make it work anyway. If I did a stupid thing, a, no matter how nice you are, there's a certain glee to prove the boss was stupid. <laughs> but if you do it, you're going to make sure it works anyway. Now, not everybody wanted that job. We were able to find out who couldn't handle it. But those that did learned very quickly how to make a budget, how to make a plan. Now it's interesting to see what's happened to those digital that were, people that left digital or were forced out of digital in the last few years. There's approximately two categories without looking at this analytically. It just seems to me. Those who learn to take that responsibility and make out a plan on a budget and run it like a business are in great demand out there. And those that never learned that, or those who became successful without ever learning it, have not done well. And it's obvious they had a chance to run their own business. Now, this idea is so obvious. The top man can't know everything. He may think he does. Matter of fact, it's kind of hard to admit you don't. But 
we can't. So individual groups can become expert and they're part of it. This is not what's taught in business school. Go to MIT and Harvard, they tell kids graduating from undergraduate school, now's your chance to be an entrepreneur. You'll never get a chance later on in business. And you know why? At business school, they say, we're teaching you to make all the decisions in the company. Now, people in college have long forgotten the scientific method and, and scholarship and, and you know the disciplines that made education useful and scholarship useful and science useful. They have these ideas now that don't bear any relationship to scholarship or, or science. And say, so, yeah, the top guy makes all the decisions. And they make the strangest set of decisions, you know, absolutely irrational. You, know. you um, uh, the nice thing about having a bunch of business units, you can say, hey, you're a small business. Some of them got to be quite large. In business, you want to grow, make profit. The traditional goals, a measurement of success of a company is growth and profit. Business school has all these kind of other funny ideas now. You really want to consolidate. Oh, of course, that's what happened to digital. They consolidated. They fired, they shut down all the groups that made the money and they consolidated. <laughs> Just like the business school wanted. Uh, it, 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 logically, it's nonsense. So these ideas, so logical, so obvious, and so strange and so much against human nature. But some wonderful things happened. Profit grew enormously, and it turned out that the next level under Anderson and myself, including my brother, weren't very bright. <laughs> they couldn't understand anything, you know? They just couldn't catch on. Suddenly, when they had the responsibility, it's amazing how smart they became, including my brother. I'm in good terms with my brother, don't quote me here. And you can see why. There's no vehicle to learn until you have responsibility. If the boss is doing everything, you, there's nothing you particularly that you have to learn, you know. When you got it, you learn. And uh, with that, we mushroomed. And soon we filled the mill. Um, the board of directors at Digital never figured that one out. He was a dean of the best business schools in the country and a former associate dean of Harvard, a uh, professor from MIT School of Business. And they never, never figured this one out, see? And never believed in it. And looked for the chance to destroying it, see? Because it's obvious nonsense. And I'm not exaggerating at all here, see? Not at all, see? Because the simple logic of trusting someone is, is against, it's against all principles. Oh, uh, today, it's much worse, you know. Today, digital fired the same 3,000 people three times each time the stock went up. <laughs> the logic there, you know, is impossible. Now, we had a flood once. You know, catastrophes are always not nice, but they're always the things you remember. And it rained for several days, and people in town knew when the river was going to rise after the rain. And uh, the concrete wall between the mill and the river wasn't there then. Okay, we put it up after that flood. And uh, the water was coming up. And we worked 24 hours a day for several days. <laughs> My brother was in New York. He came back with all the pumps you could carry on the airplane. But without any planning, without anybody saying anything, there was several truckloads of sand right there. There was 3,000 sandbags, 500 pairs of boots, and everybody was there to help. Now you see where they came from. Those people knew what to be, had to be done, and they knew they would be supported afterward. 
they knew that they could go out and buy 500 pair of boots and no one afterward would challenge them and blame them because they should have had only 400. And when crew is trusted and they trust the company, that's the wonderful thing that happened. Now Raytheon had a flood and they lost it. We had a flood and we won. <laughs> we poured a concrete wall right across the door, put a form and filled it with concrete. Um, and to me, it's a beautiful example of what people can do when, they're, when they trust. They're trusted and, and they feel that way. Now, with that attitude, we grew very fast. It was easy for us to go to Europe, partly because I'm half European with a wife. And, um, and we did very well. It always takes a little while to get a message across that we expect each of those groups to run their own business. The English operation said, um, we want to build a plant to manufacture in England. We agreed. And afterward, they came back and said, Hewlett Packard built a bigger one, and they're doing ours. You didn't make one big enough. Said, no, you don't realize. You laid out the plan. We went along with your plan, and you built one that was too small. But managers and workers are always used to blaming the management. This is slow sinking in. But little by little, they, uh, they caught on. And soon we were in every country. I think we ended up in 150 countries, and each one run by themselves. Um, we, we never went to South Africa. People thought it was because we were boycotting them, and it wasn't true. <laughs> well, they wouldn't let us run the office where we wanted to run it, with the kind of people we wanted to run it with, so we didn't go there. We almost went back, even in the middle of the boycott, because some Indian fellas and some black fellas in England want to run the office. And my attitude was, boy, if they can run an office down there, let's go. <laughs> it never quite worked out. The, um, one thing I never learned, I think I know how, but I never demonstrated it, and that is how to survive good times. It's easy to get people working together and working hard when there's hard times. But it's all too often the tendency for people to, in good times when they're doing well, to decide how wonderful they are. Uh, <coughs> in the mid-70s, we made the VAX computer and started the VMS software. And these did very well. And engineering was gloating in their success. And they set about laying out all kinds of rules and regulations to make sure they never made any mistakes. With the results that for five years we got no new products. And they were imagining themselves the greatest people on earth. And it couldn't register with them that they got nothing done for five years. Oh, but did they have a set of red tape? Oh, boy, it was magnificent. I walked into the PDB-11 group, engineering group, and I said, why don't you come up with a new machine? They said, well, it gets two, takes two years to get the, to the procedure and get approval to make it. Why start now? Next week is as good. And uh, that engineering group, it couldn't register with them that we were in trouble. They were the greatest people on earth. How could you ever criticize them? And this, after having a VAX and VMS, they had the most wonderful system. They could never make a mistake. Never get any done either. <laughs> then in about 1980, the fact we had new new products started to hurt us. Our profits went down, the stock went down, and uh, 
they all quit. Blaming me. And they were going to show me they went out to start a new company called Encore. And of course, with that attitude, they never got anywhere. They couldn't get along with each other. But now the interesting thing was what we were able to do. We were in trouble. You know, in life, we never want to have any problems. In church literature, people discuss the problem of pain and problems. And if you're a good person, if you're a good Christian, why didn't everything work out beautifully for you? Well, I can tell you the answer to that. We can't survive everything working well. And when all those senior vice presidents left, the Boston Globe said, well, that's the end of Ken Olson. There's nobody left. And it was a dismal time. Now, what we did was get the senior people together time after time after time up in Maine, in the woods, in various meeting rooms, and go over it for picking a common strategy. And we finally worked out on a simple common strategy, common theme. Interestingly, it had been proposed by the engineering vice president five years earlier. But in that time of great success, it got lost. And that theme was one computer system, one software system, no, already I've forgotten. One architecture. One architecture. Anyway, we had three. Oh, by the way, I said that in a group of digital people, about 600 people. Somebody reported to the Globe. One, two, three. My wife said, oh, you can't do that. It sounded like Hitler saying, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. <laughs> I checked it out with a number of Europeans, including some were in concentration camp. And nobody else but my wife thought of that. Uh, our French director said, every good statement has three points. Uh, anyway, with that, and everybody working together, we probably had the best turnaround in the history of business. Everybody was working together on a common theme. And everybody knew we were in trouble, and boy, did we really show them. Alas, with great success, we, uh, I'd be still there if we didn't have that great success. <laughs> now, changing direction a little bit. One of the things we introduced was networking. You, many of you know about internet. And uh, we had something for many years. Now it's called an intranet. We tied all the places of digital together. And um, it worked at relatively slow speed, and no one downloads software. And uh, messages flowed, flowed freely. When we had a meeting in some part of the world, when the meeting broke, everybody would go find some secretary's desk and ask if they could borrow the machine, and they'd get all their mail, answer the mail right there before the meeting started again. It worked beautifully. When we had these massive one-company trade shows where we take over the whole town of Cannes or the whole section of Boston, put on a magnificent show, it was done with almost no management because everybody worked together with that network. Um, and everybody, oh, and when we had a sales meeting, people who hadn't seen each other would hug each other because they were friends over the network. And uh, it was a key part of digital. And I would argue, sell that. My friends at Ford, I'd tell them about this. They'd say, why would you want to do that? If you want to know what's a good restaurant in Sydney, Australia, just ask the network, come back. 
Uh, if you said, uh, I got a size 11 man shoe on the left shoe foot and a size 12 on the right, has anybody got the opposite? We can get together and get the answers back with every other problem. Uh, and I got a problem, this computer won't work. Oh, we were in Cannes and I tell the story, everything worked perfectly. Really, there's one problem. You show one problem. And uh, it was the middle of the night and they put on network and Australia was still daylight, so the answer came back from Australia. And then as the sun came around the world, the answers came back from all over the world. And so I was selling networks with great enthusiasm. I met many times the New York Times, and they were just blank. Why would you want to do that? Uh, now they report that I was against networking all the time, um, and against PCs. The um, The government had, um, we refused to do, the original rule I made was, we won't sell to the government. We weren't pacifists, we just thought there was too much trouble. Um, one day I was called down to Washington and the Defense Department said, um, you gotta sell to us because our laboratories, the university laboratories, all use your networking. And we want to make a network tie the whole world together with, we call it ARPANET, Advanced Army, ARPA. Project Project. Yeah, it was the first network. Later on it was called Internet. I said, okay, we'll sell to you. We, I said, we'll never take a contract with you. We'll sell it to you off the price list, no specials. We did a few, I said, if you're ever in trouble, let us know, we'll do it free. We don't want any contract with you. I don't know how many funny things we did free with the spies. I don't want to know about that. But um, the, uh, a few that we did here with the mill. The, uh, but, not, but we saw networking and that became uh, internet eventually with out, wonderful outside inventions and contributions by other people. But my passion for that network and that communication has gone sour. And there are two reasons why. You learn in cooking that if a little salt does good, more salt does better. And a lot more salt will do a lot better. And a bunch of salt would really do great. No, some things don't work that way. And a little bit of networking does wonders. When it overwhelms someone's life, it does terrible things. I was at, I spoke at two IBM sales meetings. And at breakfast, no two people sat together. Part of that comes from having commission sales plans where you don't want to share anything with anybody else. But I think most of it comes from networking when it's overdone, generates loners and it's not healthy. And a little of it is good, and a cup full of salt in your bread, or a full-time internet isn't good. Now it also is easy to have a friend at 300 baud, that is, he reads it as fast as you can type. When those pages come out so fast, it's hard to be friends with people on the other side. It's also nice to get a couple messages at night. 300, oi. <laughs> now, I, there's one exception in that is I know a couple people who are separated by a few thousand miles from their wives and talking to your wife, nothing is good enough. But it's a problem today. Another problem we have today, or the other, the other the reason it worked well in times past was people used it to solve problems. When you're just looking for something to do, it's not at all the same. And when you're doing mischief, and some stuff isn't healthy to look at, something's awful to look at. Now, there's another problem that generated today. In business, in this modern world of computers, we 
suffer, I believe, because we don't assign tasks to people. The old Al Sloan's ideas are obsolete. And we know at any, whoever's running one group, we know he's only gonna be there for a year. We'll fire him, he'll, somebody else, you know, he'll quit. So no point in him being responsible. So we think we'll get this wonderful piece of software that'll run the whole, you know, whole, whole company. Usually they get it from Germany. And I was at MIT a couple weeks ago and I asked somebody in the middle of a meeting, I whispered in his ear, he said, why don't we have the total income to a department and the total expense that comes from their part of tuition and the total expenditures to that department? He's, we could never get anything simple like that. The system is so overwhelming. No easy answers. And nobody's responsible. Now, digital might be obsolete, and they clearly said I was obsolete because I didn't know what the modern world where firing people is what the important thing was. The key part is making people responsible. Now, I like to think that in Maynard, in the Hill, in the other places, we demonstrated the dedication, the fun, the excitement, the satisfaction people got for taking responsibility and living with the results. And when things went badly, they learned from it. And uh, I like to think that uh, Maynard experience is one that uh, someday people ought to look at and learn, not from me, but learn from the common sense and some of the things they should learn from Al Sloan. Now with that, I'll stop you asking me anything you want. <laughs>